Good morning. How are y'all today? Good. How are you? Doing well. Uh, Angela Strickland, the Director of Special Events at Bellinger Ferguson Home. Um, I'm excited today. We have this session my first time actually meeting Ms. Meg McCormick Fowler. Um, she's the Executive Director down at the History Museum, uh, downtown Mobile. If you have not been, I highly recommend it. Always something interesting and fun to learn about. And she's going to tell you a lot of this history of Mobile today, but if just to learn even more while y'all are in town, some search, go visit. It's a great day. Just walk around downtown and have fun. But Ms. McCormick is she is the History Museum Director. She holds a Bachelor of Arts of History and French from the University of of Alabama and a Master's of Art in the History, History of Art from Tulane University. She is currently a PhD candidate at the Art and History and Society. Before joining the History Museum of Mobile, Meg served as a visiting scholar in the Center for the Study of War and Memory at the University of South Alabama, and she also taught in the Art and Art and History Department. And in 2018, she completed her curatorial fellowship at Musée or say, I think that's the right. <laughs> and that's in Paris, if you can't tell, I can't say that correctly. Uh, but we're really excited to have her today, and um, um, she will be here to sign books. I know several of y'all bought some already last week. We do have some more copies in the gift shop, and I know she would love to sign them afterwards and talk to you about any questions that you have. Also, we do have a hot lunch today. It's fried fish, a hush puppies. Mac and cheese, cold salt, and if you have enough room, I think you should save it for homemade banana pudding. <laughs> Yummy. So please stay afterwards and have some lunch and take a walk around the gardens before it rains this afternoon. So thank y'all. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. This has been a project that I've been, um, has been in the works for a really long time, and it's so much fun to be able to share it and to see it come to fruition. Um, you will bear with me as I get out of breath really easily with a, a baby kicking on my lungs. Um, <laughs> but, but, and if you, if you have any trouble hearing me, just let me know. I can, I can always get a little closer to the microphone. So A History of Mobile and 22 Objects is an exhibition that's currently on display at the History Museum of Mobile. If you haven't been, here we are. Um, the, the History Museum is downtown Mobile, um, as Angela said in, in that very kind introduction. So this is an exhibition, and it's also, we've also published a catalog, which is which is what's for sale. Um, and so the exhibition is open through the end of the year, so there's plenty of time to come and see it, but it's really, um, it's really beautifully done. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention, we have another very exciting exhibition that will open soon at the History Museum. We have Egyptian mummies, real Egyptian mummies, coming, um, opening at the History Museum February 26th through for about four months through the end of June, so, so be sure and come by the History Museum then. They're from on loan from a, um, the National Archaeology Museum of Florence, Italy. So they've come quite, quite a way, and hopefully you're not bringing any curses with them. <laughs> so in the collection of the History Museum, we have over 117,000 objects, and all together, these 117,000 objects tell the story of Mobile. Um, so this exhibition was conceived, um, really kind of inspired by an exhibition that was at the British Museum when Neil McGregor was director there um, a little over a decade ago. There was a, a wonderful exhibition that you may have heard of at some point or been familiar with, A History of the World in 100 Objects. And there were these, there was this collaboration with the BBC and there were all these programs um, as part of it, and since then, a number of museums have done kind of spin-offs of how do we tell this great big story in as few a number of objects as possible. So this is not the History Museum's 22 most spectacular or valuable objects, but they're 22 objects that, um, that weave together a narrative of Mobile history. It's meant to be a very accessible, 
object-based guide to Mobile history, all the way from the mound builders, um, pre-colonial contact to the modern port. One of the things that is so special about this exhibition, I have curated the exhibition and edited the catalog, but I really don't get the, the bulk of the credit for it in any way. The, the catalog has been written, um, or is a, a collection of essays written by Mobile's top curators, historians, professors, writers, um, 24 really wonderful authors, one of whom is here, of course, Tom McGee, who wrote the essay on Azalea City, which we will get to, um, but really a wonderful collection of writers, a co truly a community effort. Um, and so they have written the essays and then the text that you'll find in the exhibition is taken um, and abbreviated from those essays. So I'm gonna leave a few things to, for you to discover when you get to and when you come to see the exhibition, which I hope, certainly hope that you will. And, and of course the catalog goes into so much more detail, but I wanna give you just a sense, pick a few of my favorite objects, um, try to give you a sense of this, this thread of mobile history um, and a sense of kind of some cure, how the, the curatorial process worked for this. The very first object is a fragment of a piece of pottery. So you can see that piece of pottery and then we've kind of finished this outline. So it is this palm of a hand. It's a very common motif called the, the, and, the hand eye motif. Um, commonly found around Moundville, but this was found in, in well, the northern part, or central part of the state of Alabama. Um, but this was found in this region tells us all sorts of things about the, the kind of the, the Pensacola culture, kind of more generally the mound builders who were here before colonial contact. Um, so there's all sorts of things. So we're looking in this exhibition for a, perhaps an unexpected object that was more complicated than it originally seemed. So from this, we can tell about trade patterns because that hand-eye motif is typically found up around Moundville. We know about the trade patterns of people who, who moved and are in contact with other cultures. We can um, examine the, the, con the, the shell temper of this little piece of pottery, know about what was eaten out of it, what it was, how it was used. Um, this is a, another drawing you see in the, the corner over here. Let's see if this has a... Oh, nope, uh-oh, I messed up. I thought I was, I was trying to get a, um, a laser pointer. <laughs> there is some. Um, where is it? There we go. All right, I won't try anything special. <laughs> That's all right. I thought there was too. We can imagine how it might have fit in a pot. <laughs> this is a, a mural depiction. There's some really gorgeous images um, in the catalog, in the exhibition, a mural of what this Pensacola culture settlement in the Mobile, Tensaw Delta um, might have kind of looked like and, and felt like. What we discover is that even though this um, culture is called the Pensacola culture, that is really a misnomer because the, the fulcrum of this culture in this pre-colonial era was in Mobile. It was the center of trade. Um, it was the center of really kind of the whole region as, as, and, um, and the water sources that came to get, that come together um, still, of course, today in the Delta. So all sorts of remarkable things you can find from the simplest and most unassuming object. Other things in the exhibition are not at all simple or unassuming. This is one of the History Museum's most spectacular um, objects. It is a portrait of Henry de Tanti that was painted by Dutch master Nicholas Mays. Now, Nicholas Mays was Rembrandt's star pupil. So he trained with Rembrandt, was, was the, the star of his studio. Um, and it's an extraordinary painting as an art historian, really fascinating in, in all sorts of ways, an incredible example of Dutch portraiture. But Henry de Tanti, um, along with Bienville um, and, and, and the orders of Iberville, um, 
was one of the original founders of Mobile. So he had explored many parts of North America before making his way, helping to establish Mobile. And this original settlement of Mobile is 27 miles north of where, of downtown Mobile today. So a, a place that we now call 27 Mile Bluff, this old Mobile site. Um, so this part of this essay, this part of the exhibition talks about the colonial experience and how his experience of, of a rather rough and tumble colonial mobile was, was quite um, typical in many ways. After his death, the, um, the site was later moved to, and, and Fort Condi was built um, in 1723, so moved to the site of downtown Mobile today. In speaking about Native Americans, um, you might not expect a violin. Again, an unexpected object. This is another really spectacular object in the History Museum's collection. It's a violin that belonged to Red Eagle or William Weatherford, who was a leader in the Creek Wars. Um, really extraordinary um, object and, and incredible that we have it from dates to the late 1790s. Um, he negotiated, so he, he was a leader in the, the Creek Wars, which were extremely complicated, but kind of essentially a civil war that played out against the backdrop of the War of 1812. Um, and, and ultimately and eventually, he negotiated a treaty with Andrew Jackson. There's a very famous engraving of him sitting with Andrew Jackson and ceded millions and millions of acres of land in Alabama and Georgia as part of this treaty. Now, part of the land that was kept is the land that the Porch Creek Indians still reside on today. So, so that's part of that legacy. But once there was all of this available land um, in, in Alabama and, and in Georgia, but if we're speaking about Alabama, there was this in, massive influx of settlers after this treaty that he negotiated, and then that is how um, that those settlers then voted for Alabama to become a state in 1819. So really massive ramifications. Um, but this violin speaks to his dual European and Creek ancestry. And so we can think about kind of the, the um, duality, but also the conflict of the European and Creek parts, um, both within himself, but also within culture more broadly. He had a Creek mother and a Scottish father. He had red hair, according to all the depictions of it. <laughs> One of the most poignant objects in the collection is this child's coffin. It's about this big. Um, a coffin that was used in the yellow fever epidemic. And so note how very kind of small it is, how it's shaped to the, the shape of a child's body. It was a newly designed, newly patented design that um, allowed, you can see perhaps some um, hooks kind of in the front where it could be closed and bolted shut, be really airtight. This yellow fever was a fearsome disease and, and creating kind of an airtight, concealed um, coffin was, was something new and important. Now, the study of the yellow fever epidemic has become quite timely. We picked this object. Um, before anyone had ever heard of COVID-19. Um, but yet the yellow fever epidemic has profoundly shaped Mobile. There were 11 major outbreaks between 1818 and 1853, but really there were smaller outbreaks every single year. And Mobile looks the way it does um, in part because of yellow fever. I'll give you just a couple examples. One is that I mentioned that colonial Old Mobile site was founded 27 miles north of where Mobile is today. Well, it was in large part, not exclusively, but in part a yellow fever epidemic that wiped out part of that original settlement that said, okay, this is not a good place. We need to find another place to, to move Mobile. And so there was a decision to move it. So Mobile physically is where it is because of the yellow fever outbreak in its original site. The community of Spring Hill, which is in the western part of Mobile, um, also developed very early in the 19th century, but and continued throughout the 19th century, as a place to go to escape yellow fever. Um, so families that could 
have a summer home up on the hill. They thought they were escaping the, the miasmas, the bad air that kind of was coming up. But in fact, they, those low-lying areas bred mosquitoes that did cause yellow fever. So in a sense, it worked. Um, it didn't, it, not for the reasons that, that they thought, but um, one of the fun, not fun, but perhaps um, fascinating things about studying yellow fever in this epidemic that we're in is that all, I mean, all of the similarities that you find in the 19th century, you know, they say things like, we get, you know, reading these letters of, of, you know, that are in our collection of people who are um, writing during the yellow fever epidemics, and they're saying, you know, the numbers are being reported, but we're not really sure if their numbers are accurate. And there's a big disagreement between the city and the county on how to handle this. And it's a whole lot worse in New Orleans, so nobody go over to New Orleans, and nobody from New Orleans can come here. So really kind of interesting, remarkable similarities. The Church Street Graveyard um, was found. Again, just the legacies of this are all around us. The fifth object is a hand cart that we use to talk about Mobile's export economy. In the 19th and, and the early 20th centuries, Mobile's economy was very much built on cotton. So long before Mobile was the Azalea City, we were the cotton city. Um, by the 1850s, Mobile was one of the largest ports in the South, and that created extraordinary wealth. But of course, extraordinary wealth for some Mobilians. And so we remember here, um, kind of how this um, economy was built, but then also who it was that was doing the labor. So you can see a photograph that's sort of the late 19th century, but, but very kind of similar, the cotton wharfs um, before the Civil War, of course, enslaved laborers, afterwards low-wage laborers, um, kind of creating and, and doing this work and imagine who it might be that, that would have pushed this hand cart. The port of after the Civil War, um, the Port of Mobile really struggled to diversify exports, and, and so there was a period from about 1880 to 1915 when the federal government poured millions of dollars into improving the harbor. The channel was dredged um, in 1890 to allow deep ocean-going um, vessels to come into the port, deep draft vessels, and by the turn of the century, timber had emerged as another very important, still an export economy, but timber had, had emerged and revitalized Mobile's waterfront. In our discussion of slavery, we talk about the experience of urban slavery and how that is different from the plantation slavery that people so often think about. Um, in a city, those who were enslaved worked as painters and cookers, fishermen, blacksmiths, laundresses, sailors, cooks, cabinet makers, cobblers, tailors, carpenters, on and on. There was lots of, of skilled labor. This is a pass, again, part of our collection. Um, what's so interesting about it, and, and maybe some in the front can read it, but, but at the top it says City of Mobile, and it says Mayor's Office. There's a place to fill in the date, 1st April, 1859. Um, and it's a pass for an enslaved woman named Mary Ann, aged about 30 years, to reside off premises of her owner, which was a much more common thing in again in, in an urban setting that um that, that you know then you would have to have a pass to to go from where you lived to work every day essentially um what's particularly poignant about this object is that the mayor's office in 1859 was the history is, is the building that is today the history museum of mobile where we work so it was built in 1855 as the as city hall and so this pass would have been signed in and executed in the same building in which it still resides, which is a, uh, an interesting and um, a reminder of the very long and sometimes difficult histories that the buildings all around us have. In talking about the Civil War, again, we wanted to tell an unexpected story. Perhaps the expected story would have been of the Hunley submarine that was built in Mobile, the, the first um, submarine used in warfare, um, but instead, but we, but we went a little bit of a different direction and talked about um, blockade runners. And so John Sledge, wonderful local author, wrote a, a beautiful essay um, 
and, and thinking about how our connection to the Gulf and to the water really created and, and influenced the experience of Civil War Mobile. Um, and in particular, this, this little silver object, you might guess what it is. It is a speaking trumpet, so the, the kind of megaphone that you would, um, to project your voice over the, the crashing waves of the sea. Uh, and owned by Lieutenant Stone, and he's holding it right here in, in his picture. So it was um, holding it there, so kind of his, his faithful attribute. In talking about Mardi Gras, oh my goodness, so difficult to choose. How do you pick an object? Um, curator of the Mobile Carnival Museum, Cart Blackwell, wrote this delightful essay about how Joe Kane revived Mardi Gras um, and situated it around Fat Tuesday. And so the object here is a costume that belonged to a man named Red Foster in the 1970s. And so in this guise, Red Foster, again in the 1970s, is impersonating Joe Kane, who lived in the 1880s and um, or, or the, the 1800s and, and then in the 1860s revived this tradition. And, and Joe Kane, so this is Red Foster impersonating Joe Kane, who was impersonating this fictitious chief, Chief Slackerbimmer Renica. <laughs> I've, I've practiced that one. Chief Slack, when, when we're not so ambitious. Um, and so in, in this essay, in, in the catalog and in, in the exhibition, Cart does a wonderful job of capturing not only the spirit of Mardi Gras, which is Mobile's, as, as he will often say, Mobile's oldest living tradition, but also explaining how our modern, modern Mardi Gras celebration was really tied and evolved out of Reconstruction era Mobile. A time when Mobilians were looking for celebration in, in what was otherwise a bleak time. Lots of Civil War symbolism, especially in those early celebrations. Um, so uh, there's this wonderful quote, and, and those of you who may be from Mobile will, will certainly be familiar with it, but in case you're not, I will, I will read it. It's a um, Eugene Walter quote um, about kind of you know, the, the delightful absurdity of, of Mardi Gras. It says, if as a child you saw every Mardi Gras, the figure of folly chasing death around the broken column of life, beating him back with the full scepter from which dangled gilded pig bladders. Wouldn't you see the world in different terms, too? And that is what, um, that is, and, and there are other traditions as well. That is the, one of um, the tradition of, of um, the, the order of myths that folly chases death. Um, and one, one night a year, folly wins, right? One on Mardi Gras, one, one time a year, um, folly, de folly defeats death. So with so few objects, we were looking for examples that could be very flexible. When it came to education, we chose Spring Hill College, which allows us to tell a number of different stories. It was Mobile's um, first institution of higher education. It is representative of Mobile's very rich Catholic heritage, which is not unique along the Gulf Coast, certainly something we share with New Orleans, but, but quite unique within the state and part of that colonial legacy. Um, and then again, the development of Spring Hill, um, Mobile's move westward, um, which, which I mentioned with Yellow Fever, um, but, but how, how this kind of town grows adjacent to Mobile and then eventually becomes incorporated. The object itself is this delightful exam book, um, and it's a physics exam from 1892, and I think it's kind of so delightful because it's a physics exam like we've probably all suffered through at some point in a river whose breadth is 3,000 feet, the velocity of three miles per hour, and a man swims across it, keeping at right angles. You know, what's the velocity of the current in feet per second? How long is it going to take him to get across? You know, all of these, these physics questions um, reminding us that some things, physics at least, physics does not change uh, from this 1892 book. This is one of my favorite objects. Um, it's, a, it's a sculpture by contemporary Mobile um, sculptor, 
Bruce Larson, um, who, who did it in, in 2002, depicts a story of one family in the particularly difficult 1906 hurricane. And, and I, I, you can't do it justice in an image and, and really see and understand how it works, but there is here a handle, if you can see, and so it's interactive, and so you're able to, to, to turn this handle, and as you turn the handle, these different um, waves churn together, right? And you see this father and this baby son, and they reach, and they almost touch, and then they get pulled apart again, and they reach, and they almost touch, and they get pulled apart again, and you turn, and oh my goodness, the first time I saw it, I mean, you just keep turning it like it may be next time there. I can get them to me. And, and an incredible, really incredible sculpture. It's the story of the Werneth family. Um, and in this essay, um, Brett Pappas, who's a, a local writer at Mobile Bay Magazine, does an extraordinary job of capturing the experience of living in a place where hurricanes are always looming, live kind of with one eye towards the Gulf. He writes, living in a place where water and wind shape the landscape by the hour is a reminder that everything, even the ground beneath our feet, is temporary. Something that certainly connects us with previous generations of mobilians. The difference, of course, being that we have the technology to predict hurricanes and how frightening that experience must have been in 1906, for example, when every afternoon thunderstorm might be an afternoon thunderstorm in the summer, or it might be a, an enormous hurricane that, that comes in and destroys and devastates. This is a photograph looking down Dolphin Street of that 1906 hurricane that was so devastating for the Warnett family. We use a silver coffee urn to tell the story of the Creole Fire Department. The Creole Fire Department was the first um, volunteer fire department in Mobile. It was a vibrant part of the Mobile community. And um, again, perhaps an unexpected object to have a, a silver coffee urn um, representing fire, firemen and firefighters. And, but there was really such a rich social tradition around this um, around this experience of the Creole firehouse. And so that's what that coffee urn helps us capture. In World War I, we have a uniform of a Alabama man who was part of the, the Rainbow Division, um, a famous division um, that fought mostly in France, but, but around Europe in World War I. General Plummer was um, famously said to have commented on these, this, the, so there were parts of the Rainbow Division from all over the country, so they said, you know, it stretched like a rainbow across, um, across the country. But of the, the Alabamians in particular, he said, in times of war, send me all the Alabamians you can get, but in times of peace, for the Lord's sake, send them to somebody else. <laughs> So they developed a reputation for being particularly fierce and ferocious. And here there's a, a photograph of, this, um, of them coming home down Government Street, right through downtown Mobile. Um, a few folks in the crowd wearing masks um, at, at, towards the tail end of the Spanish flu pandemic. This is another favorite. favorite. Um, it is a pastel of the Bankhead Tunnel under construction. Um, so if you've ever wondered how a tunnel gets built, um, this, is, this is the period between World War I and World War II, um, around 1938. If you wonder how a tunnel gets built, which I, I have no idea, you gotta dig it out. I mean, how is this, this, is what, this is how it works. Um, how the Bankhead Tunnel was built, at least. It was built in dry dock at ADSCO, the Alabama Dry Dock and Shipbuilding. Um, and so, and then floated out and sunk into the Mobile River. And Michael Thomason writes a really wonderful essay about this whole interwar period, about the contradictions that Mobile has in this period. It is a period of progress, um, but also one of 
tradition. And so that very much like this pastel in a way, Roderick McKenzie, well-known mobile um, artist, trained in this very 19th century style of vibrant kind of pastel colors, and yet he is representing a, a quintessentially 20th century picture of progress. The Bankhead Tunnel was a WPA-funded project. Um, what the, perhaps the biggest in Mobile, but all, although there were others, there are murals in the History Museum that were WPA projects. Um, as well as Fort Whiting was, was built um, as part of the WPA project. But, but Mobile in this interwar period is um, kind of social modes of, of living in Mobile are still very 19th century, look very much like the 19th century. Mobile doesn't kind of get fully thrust into the, the modern 20th century until World War II. There's this wonderful photograph of the workers inside the, the Bankhead Tunnel as it's being built. I say they're my, this one's my, they're all my favorites. Um, a very small ID that tells a big story of war mobilization, again, um, This, a, a, a woman who, a Rosie Riveter type, um, a woman who worked at ADSCO at the Alabama Dry Dock and Shipbuilding Company in World War II, allows us to think about the, the women and, and the African Americans who mobilized during World War II, um, and, but then also how Mobile mobilized in shipbuilding during World War II and, and became, um, and, 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 one of the, the, among other things, one of the really kind of notable things about World War II and Mobile was the population boom, um, which was so big and so extraordinary that the city said, it just would ask citizens, if you have a guest room, please take people in. Um, really extraordinary population boom. Um, again, that kind of rocketed Mobile in, into this thoroughly modern era. I love this ad. You can see her thumbprint on the back of it. Um, she signed this, this tiny little ID badge. She could have been a, a welderette. There were a lot of um, women who worked in welding at ADSCO um, and then also in the administrative office. This is that where, where she would have worked that shipbuilding operation, ADSCO, another McKinsey painting. So the catalog's cover image that, that you saw at the very beginning, and if you've seen the catalog, um, this chair is, is an image of this chair. And we it's a chair that was at the Battle House um, and that we use kind of to tell this very long history of the Battle House. Now, it's a special chair, um, not only because we have a photo of Woodrow Wilson sitting in this chair as a sitting president, um, on his visit to Mobile in 1913, so, so that's one special thing. But it has this crest of Mobile, so, um, a, and, then, and I know that would be hard to see, but if you're looking at the cover of the catalog, um, each flag that has flown over Mobile, the six flags that have flown over Mobile within that crest. But again, we really use this, this chair that's from the Battle House, in a sense the object here is really the Battle House Hotel marvelous downtown Mobile Hotel um, that in a lot of ways has tracked kind of as goes the Battle House, so goes downtown Mobile. Um, and so for over a century, it kind of maps the rise, fall, and rebirth of, of downtown. This, the existing Battle House, the one that you can see today, was painted, I mean it was painted, um, was built in 1906. Um, and in its earliest years, it hosted Mobile's lavish balls, banquets, receptions, again, a presidential visit. As Mobile contended with two world wars, it served as a rallying point for war relief efforts. Um, I mentioned the housing shortage in World War II. Of course, hotels were filled, um, any, any available beds. Um, and you can imagine kind of in those hectic and anxious days, wonderful photograph of a parade, um, a World War II parade right down Royal Street. Mobile was this kind of beehive of um, activity and, and the businesses and entertainment venues downtown, very much the center of that. 
In the late 1950s and 60s, like so many places across America, downtown declined as Mobile expanded into the suburbs. Um, again, like so many downtowns, the Battle House closed in 1974 and was essentially abandoned. This is, this is a photograph of those years. Um, and downtown had become really a kind of a shabby place with crumbling infrastructure. Um, and the Battle House specifically was in such disrepair that there were conversations in the 1990s about just tearing it down and turning it into a parking lot. And thank goodness that that did not happen. This is the Battle House Hotel today. Um, turned around um, the retirement systems of Alabama, built the, the tower that you see behind it, bought the Battle House, restored it. It is a marvelous, wonderful hotel. And that really catapulted um, the, the revival of downtown Mobile, which pre-pandemic, at least, we'll see, hopefully the restaurants are up. There were 60 restaurants in downtown Mobile. Um, really wonderful, marvelous place to walk around. So many museums, cultural sites. The Sanger Theater has a very similar history um, of, of being essentially abandoned and, and coming back being under such an important um, venue for arts and culture in Mobile. Now here's the one you've been waiting for. Azalea City. <laughs> I feel, I feel, uh, and I have to admit, I feel very um, um, out of place speaking about the history of, of Billy Graff and of Azalea's <laughs> top of you sitting right here. These are notes from his essay um, entirely. Um, Tom writes beautifully about how Azalea's and Mobile's Azalea Trail literally put Mobile on the tourism map, most especially and kind of at its peak after World War II when car travel and car trips became so popular. So we looked in our collection and said, we really don't have an object that represents, that, that captures that kind of azalea, the, the beauty and the marvel of azaleas, this kind of azalea city idea that we wanted to get across. And so we commissioned this work. Um, and Matthew Patterson is a glass sculptor at the University of South Alabama, and, and he really ran with it and um, was very excited by the project. So there are 40, 40 glass azaleas um, on a sculpture that, that's about like this. Um, and he says he imagines them kind of climbing. This might be one of the, the skyscrapers, kind of loosely, one of the, the, um, the skyscrapers downtown, kind of cli the azaleas climbing this, this city and, and, and kind of representing this idea of Azalea City. He works a lot with um, flora in glass and, and so really did a marvelous job of capturing that. We know that azaleas came to Mobile in the mid 19th century um, to the Gulf Coast region from Asia but by way of Europe. Within the city of Mobile, um, azaleas proliferated Really, again, the, the influence of hurricanes after a disastrous 1916 hurricane, um, uh, there was a, a large-scale effort to beautify the city, start really seeing a lot of these plants pop up. The turning point in the Azalea's popularity within Mobile was 1928 when a man named Sam Lackland, who did also came up with all sorts of fun ideas for Mobile, Deep Sea Rodeo Tournament, also came up with... Um, the, the Mobile's Azalea Trail. He had been to Charleston and said, oh my goodness, people love, the, people are flocking to Charleston to see the azaleas. We could plant a few more and make it a trail and do this ourselves. Um, it went to the Chamber of Commerce. The Azalea Trail was born. Um, and it was in this period, shortly after in the 1930s, that Bellingraft Gardens began to open to the public on a daily basis. Um, again, this is a, another Roderick McKenzie painting of the, the azaleas in Bellingraph. As I mentioned, the peak of the azalea trail, tourism was after World War II when there was lots of car travel and, and you know, that was something that was very attractive and you could get in your car and drive and see, see this trail. Commentators said things like, the beauty of those brilliant azaleas in bloom rivals the Washington cherry blossoms or Pasadena's roses. And so, of course, while we are, these are some kind of close-ups of the, that sculpture and, and those glass azaleas. 
Um, and so then, of course, we are still very proudly the Azalea City. A few things have contributed to the, the ups and downs of the popularity of azaleas and, and of the azalea trails. Um, one is new varieties grown, um, were cultivated that were able to be grown in colder climates. And so the azaleas became not quite so rare in the country um, and, and thus lost perhaps a bit of the exclusivity that Mobile and, and Deep South places claimed on them. But then also as suburbs um, grew and lot sizes got smaller and smaller, they accommodated less and less kind of the giant mounding azalea plants that, that we still get to enjoy here. This is an appropriate week to be talking about the Senior Bowl. The Senior Bowl will be played on Saturday. Um, so much sporting history in Mobile. Um, baseball, of course, has a very rich tradition as we've been so reminded of with the death of Hank Aaron this week. Um, the Senior Bowl is a showcase event for seniors and um, college seniors to come. Kind of, and, and the, the phrase is, you know, the, the draft starts in Mobile. So to be um, a chance for NFL scouts, kind of a last chance to see before the draft has been played in Mobile since 1951. In thinking about civil rights, um, this is a, another really kind of extraordinary object that the History Museum has. And this is John LaFleur's typewriter. John LaFleur was the leader of the civil rights movement in Mobile. Um, and his weapon of choice was the typewriter. And, and so a very kind of apt symbol, he wrote over 50,000 letters. He worked as a postman. He knew the power and the importance of letter writing. Um, and so over 50,000 letters advocating for civil rights. And because of him and some of the partnerships that he created in the community, the civil rights movement looked quite different in Mobile than it did in, say, Selma or Birmingham. Um, so, you know, in thinking about how we choose these objects and how we tell these stories, there are some places where we look to tell um, kind of stories of like the, the woman who worked at ADSCO in World War II with the ID badge, you know, kind of everyday people. And then some, we've got Henry de Tante, we've got John LaFleur. Some are kind of the, these giants, these big things in Mobile. Um, we're really looking to tell all different types of stories um, environmental history, sporting history, um, cultural, social histories, all sorts of different types of histories. And, and sometimes that means telling the stories of some really important key figures in Mobile history. Lots more things to discover in the exhibition. Um, we talk about Brooklyn. Brooklyn Army Airfield was so important in World War II and in that wartime production. It was also devastating when the air base closed in 1969. This flag on the left is the very last flag that flew over Brooklyn Army Airfield. When Brooklyn closed, 14,000 jobs were lost, which represented 10% of the workforce, and sent Mobile into a, a decade-long recession. In the center, we have um, a selection of 20th and 21st century literature writers that really bring to life um, the whole 20th and, and 21st century in the written word. And then finally, um, not finally, but I'm in this slide, um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill um, of 2010. This was an oil containment boom in that environmental history that, that um, was so important to um, and so devastating to the ecology of the Gulf and, and certainly then for anyone in the, the seafood business, um, really deeply devastating um, oil spill. So this, this, what you actually see here is this orange boom, um, which was a containment device that would float, part of it would float and then part of it would, would kind of fall down in the water. And so all sorts of different efforts to make a, um, barriers, physical barriers around the oil and, and stop the spread. The last object is the wheel of the SS Gateway City. Um, again, a favorite. They're all my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> the SS Gateway City was the ship that Mobile businessman Malcolm McLean 
used as proof of concept for containerization. And so containerization, of course, is this brilliant idea that a standard, and, and I explained this and I know a lot of you will know exactly what we're talking about, but it's so important in literally the history of the whole world. Um, this, this idea that you could have a container that fits on a ship and it's a standard size that fits on a train and the same size that will then fit on a truck. And you can move that container with all of your Amazon purchases from China from the ship to the train to the truck and allow goods to move around the world and then 90% less expensively, a 90% reduction in cost than previous methods of unloading from the ship into the trains and unloading. That whole process is called containerization and it was invented by a mobile businessman, Malcolm McLean. And the very first container ship, his proof of concept, is the ship that this wheel came from, the SS Gateway City. So we say this is the wheel that steered the ship, that carried the metal boxes, that changed the world. <laughs> and that is not an overstatement um, in the least. Today, the port of Mobile connects Mobile and the Gulf to 12,000 miles of inland waterways. Um, and what's really special about the port of Mobile is that in some ways it brings us full circle to Colonial Mobile. We once again have a port-centered, port-based economy, um, a lively, vibrant, active port as we did in Mobile. Um, and we also have a, a port that has created a multinational city. There are so many international, multinational companies that have come because of the port, just as in Colonial Mobile, all of these different countries um, coming and making Mobile their home. Now the very last thing, both within the catalog um, and also in the exhibition, is that we say, what are we missing? And this is perhaps the most important question or, or that we pose the, the most important part of the exhibit. We know there are stories missing um, and in, if you, when you come to the exhibition, there's actually a place where you can write and say what, you, you know, what stories we're missing and then hang them on the wall and, and leave them for other people to come and see what others have written. Um, and so we know that there are things we're missing. It's only 22 objects. And, but it's also, asking this question is also about showing or unveiling the historical process, showing how historians create narratives every single day. And I'll tell you what, I'm, what I mean by that. It's easy to sometimes to read a history book or to walk into a museum and say, oh, this is the one story. This is how it happened. This is this nice, clean, shiny narrative of, of exactly what happened. Um, but in fact, there are always choices being made. And that's really easy to see and imagine when there are only 22 objects. You can imagine how different objects would have told a different story. Um, but in fact, this is the process that's always happening. And so it's so important for curators and historians and, and the public to always be asking, what are we missing? Whose voice are we missing? Or, or what, is, what is quintessentially mobile to me even that, that is missing? What, what is it that is not here? So we say this is not the history of mobile and 22 objects. It is a history. It is not the definitive history. It is a history of mobile. Different objects would have told a different story, and future generations will no doubt have many more stories to tell. Thank you. Excellent.